Uh, welcome to the pregame show for uh, book three, chapter seven. I am Eric Scott to be. These are the dungeon scrawlers. You see that our team is slightly diminished. Uh, we have Yang Yang Wang, Rhiannon Held, Aaron Evans, and a uh, green screen. And a cat. Um, and a cat. Under the Can green screen, the if cat? you look. Yeah. Randy's cat will be playing Rogar today. <laughs> oh, my God. Sturge and Kalith are both um, to be played by the DM. So. <laughs> Rumpus Imperator wants to know if you drop if I'm still in charge. Yes. Wow, Brian that is instantly always the noticed. Rule. Brian instantly noticed your face, Eric, and called it out. Uh, yes, you may have noticed that I have no beard. I uh, cut it off on Friday. Um, my wife is off on vacation, and she forbids me to shave in her presence. Uh, but she's not back for two weeks. And so I said, don't worry, it'll be back by the time you're back. And she said, grow beard hairs, grow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, it's an interesting thing. Uh, I was telling Aaron, sometimes I need to, uh, you know, just check how old I look. And apparently <laughs> I don't look old yet. So, <laughs> yeah, Brian Curtillo, Brian has known me for a long time. Brian has never met me with no beard. I don't think any of you have ever seen me with no beard. Not particularly. It, it was weirding me out. I was just like, okay, but we got to move on from this here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember that when I was a kid, my father always had a mustache and then he decided to shave it while I was at a friend's house and I came back and I was like, doppelganger! <laughs> <laughs> I was completely freaked out. Like, who the hell is that? It See, took I'm me like a whole day to kind of like trust that that was actually my father. I'm used to the vacation gaining like facial hair because it was before they had kids but apparently that was when my father gained his mustache that he's mm -hmm. had since as he decided to like grow it out while mom was wherever um so i sort of assume that like that's that's when you like get it through the raggedy stages and then it's ready <laughs> when your partner gets home. <laughs> the, uh... they're doing a poll what i should do about the beard mm -hmm. make sure you go vote in the poll by the way I don't know. I feel so strongly that people should do with their hair what that makes them happy. My husband totally. will be like, What should I do with my hair? I'm like, No, you decide that. He's like, No, but give me, tell me what you think. I'm like, mm -mm, mm -mm. I grew my beard in 2004. <laughs> it weirds me out. And I have not shaved it ever since then. So, I have like opinions about facial hair and probably would express them to some future partner just because, like, for kissing. I feel like that is an experience that I'm having where That's know, fair. it changes yeah. the experience. So uh, it's my husband grew a pandemic beard. It's different. It's not better or worse. There yeah. variety is the spice of life um, <laughs> in, a, my, in a monogamous relationship. <laughs> my wife busts up laughing whenever she sees me without a beard. So like Ooh. kissing me, she's just like, Ooh. ah, I'm making out with a teenager. This is weird. <laughs> <laughs> Which you are I no mean, that sounds terrible, but uh, we started dating when I was 19. So, eh, you know, she's, yeah. So that that, that oh. change, though, is a friend of mine was telling me this like new cow effect. So, like, if within like actual cattle, like if the, the bull gets bored, they'll like throw a blanket on a cow and the bull's brain goes, oh, new cow. So that sort of like oh. facial hair, no facial hair, glasses, contacts, haircut, like somehow can trick your brain and going, oh, this is novel when it's not actually novel. <laughs> um, but I've definitely noticed that so far. <laughs> you know, yes. oh, new cow. <laughs> Invest in some blankets. I'm gonna say, Eric, if you're <laughs> that's not wife. something I'll ever say to my partner. Oh, new cow. No, but... that's our inside joke then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. New cow. <laughs> Reactions to my beardlessness have fallen largely into two categories. Some people are like, whoa, why did you do that? And then some people are like, you had a beard? And I'm like, thanks, man. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, I got pretty mad. Like the people who didn't notice when I got contacts. Because mm -hmm. um, that happened, I think, in like 2002 or 2003, and I've had them since. And I had big, chunky glasses, sort of like the end of the 90s style, as far mm -hmm. as like big glasses. 
Uh, and like some people were ju- and I was just like look <laughs> <laughs> I did this for me but also for you <laughs> like, remind me I exist please <laughs> okay so I um, oh. I promised that I would tell everybody the anchovy story so when I was a kid we, we were talking before the hangout about um kids refusing to eat particular foods and stuff because kids can be very picky eaters and when i was a kid um once um i well actually it was several times two times in particular i inadvertently trolled my best friend regarding food because i would tell him that my parents fed me something anyway this is what happened so i was a kid in the um in the late 80s and 90s. And in that era, what was the thing that every kid loved? Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, right? Right, obviously. So my parents were like, hmm, how do we get him to eat mushrooms? Ah, we tell him that they're anchovies on pizza because that's what the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles would eat. (laughs) So they ordered a pizza with mushrooms, They fed it to me. They told me it was anchovies. I was like, wow, this is great. And they're like, yes, success. He's going to (laughs) start eating mushrooms now. Anyway, I went and told my friend and I said, oh, my parents got me anchovies on pizza. It was amazing. I loved it. Mm." And he's like, oh, well, okay. So he went and told his parents, hey, I want an anchovies pizza. And they're like, I don't know, Brian, maybe, maybe not. And he's like, yeah, I really do. Get it for me, please. Eric said he really liked it. And they're like, Uh, See, and I think my friend's parents were a little bit smarter than this, but they went with it anyway. And so they ordered him an anchovies pizza and he took one bite of it and he was like, ah, ah." now anchovies. Oh my goodness, um, we got super rated. Wow, hello raiders. We got rated with a party of 369 people from Joe Oh, nice. Hey. Oh man. What is this? I don't know this, but they're in trouble. Yeah, what is this? Death, they're saying death to Thyramilius. I, yeah, okay. Like so, Thrym, um, like uh, the lay of Thrym? Yeah, I don't know. Perhaps. So well, it turned tires. out that they were, <laughs> they were mushrooms, not anchovies. Mm-hmm. And my friend was very unhappy. And this would have been a one off, except that it wasn't because the next time, um, I would go over to his house and they'd make us macaroni and cheese. And I would just like, ah, uh, I don't like this. Uh, I can't eat this. Uh, and they could never figure out why. And uh, <laughs> I kept saying, oh, well, you know, it's because my parents put onions on it. And he and his mom could never figure out what I meant by onions. And it turns out that it was just pepper that I meant. What is with your parents? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I think the I think the fault is mostly my fault that uh, I just Tremilius misunderstood what they angel. were saying. Anyway, I don't know. I will say like when we had a kid, there was a certain thread of now we're going to prank him a lot happening. Um, so I believe in your parents being like these are called onions, but it's actually pepper. <laughs> <laughs> These are called anchovies, but they're actually mushrooms. Anyway, so they made um they made an uh macaroni and cheese with onions for my friend, and he was like, "Oh no, this is terrible!" No, inadvertently guess, trolled him again. I Did guess my parents were you? too like honest and literal because the closest we ever got was um we had uh dried grape bars, like the sort of um cookie cookie bars. And like, that's just what they were. Um, And I swear I was probably an adult before I was like, dried grape bars, raisin bars. And apparently raisins were a sticking point when I was a little, little kid. So they became dried grape bars and that was fine. Totally different, tasted great. (laughs) But there was no lie there. I just had to like realize it. The greatest lie is carob. When you're a kid and someone gives you something with carob instead of chocolate. <laughs> those six lit candies. I love those. I have a question. Yeah. So there was a discussion on the Discord in the lore channel about how technically, according to Ed Greenwood, the accordion is the canonical realms instrument. Ooh. Okay. Okay. 
So I have this. Oh, yeah. I can have uh, an accordion, but I only know how to do one thing. Ooh. <laughs> so I'm just going to have this. And in dramatic moments, <laughs> it's canonical now. And, That's awesome. and the guy who brought this up, unfortunately, is uh, is catching up on the first the first book, the first season, so he won't appreciate it. Your, your, day, your expressiveness it. as you do it also it just works. makes That's it. What it. Helps That's you. what makes it. Yeah. That's what helps you know what the hell I'm playing. We need to dun 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 gif gif of yeah. The, somebody the clip recording. it quick. Oh yeah. <laughs> nice we may have had that conversation and i was like my sister has a full-size accordion and i was like is there any way you can teach me to play an accordion for tomorrow she's like well i have a little one let's see what we can do so i have to admit yeah. do you know how when you're a kid and you sit down at like a piano and i don't know if other people had this but i was always like okay clearly i am mozart now <laughs> right in my head I'm like okay I'm just gonna be a genius at this probably okay so I've grown out of that except every time I put my hands on the accordion my brain's like now we play lady of Spain <laughs> I literally I mean you guys have seen I literally know this that's it it's, uh, I'm not playing lady of Spain but but there's a little part of my brain's like okay now now play lady of Spain like, <laughs> no <laughs> I mean, once you get good enough, we don't even need Sirenscape anymore. Just have you providing all the background accompaniments. So basically, we're going to have to go to a lot of dockside taverns, and pirate ships, and uh, talk to a lot of sketchy, like, organ grinders, maybe. Yes. Or... And to see Perry. <laughs> So someone someone brought me an Irish whistle back from Ireland. So hey. you know, I'll learn to play that. We can, I can accompany I you on it. <laughs> Wait, I have the same whistle. Do you? Yeah, somebody what? brought me back the same thing from Ireland. <laughs> what if it's the same friend? All right, well, I need to run inside and check on dinner. I'll be right back. I was gonna say, darkest. Sea Darkest Westgate is full of those dun 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 <laughs> moments. Oh, absolutely. So, she needs this also it could save it for the uh, telenovela one shot. There we go. Ah, uh, yeah, Brian Cortillo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Looks like uh, a couple of times. So. <laughs> As, oh, I was going to say, like, Brian did it. Westgate, Jay I did don't it. think, has a lot of accordion players, so it seems a bit sort of like happy. Darkest Westgate. Yeah, happiness is in short supply in Darkest Westgate. Oh, it looks like uh, our raiders are telling us a little bit about uh, the campaign that they're coming from. Yeah, that's pretty okay. cool. Thanks for telling us about that uh, epic fight with an angel. Apparently, there were like 400 of them. I mean, uh, wow. no, that's just how many people raided the channel. Well, <laughs> they say the gunslinger artificer killed the angel who was his father, and then they made like the rest of the enemies uh, surrender. Like, it sounds like they have a lot of like familial enemies, just like our campaign. Yeah. What do you mean a lot? I think oh. you mean all. <laughs> yeah, pretty much all. If they if they didn't start off being related to one of our characters, it definitely becomes a later reveal. Right. <laughs> They're either related to you or sleeping with you. Not both, just one or the other. Uh -huh. <laughs> that's the, yeah. Well, they yeah. might be related that's when we, to That's you. when we jump the shark. Is when... They might be related to you through another relative <laughs> of yours. Like, I'm just saying that's possible. That's, that's all I'm saying. I mean, if you go back far enough, we're all related. Although in the realms, I mean, you really have to go back again. For... Yeah, I was going to say, like, how are... Yeah, in the realms, you, you have to go species. back at least three yeah. generations. <laughs> well, in the realms, everyone is related to Elminster at some point, so... <laughs> you think I'm kidding. Anyway. Um... <laughs> so let's yeah. see. What else have people been up to? I have been playing Baldur's Gate again. The last time I played Baldur's Gate was, you know... 
20, 22 years ago. And uh, I bought myself the enhanced edition and I've been playing through it. And uh, it's it's gone pretty well. Uh, yeah. It reminds me how ridiculous um, inventory management always is, but you know. Uh, this is the, I loved, um, you know, I loved the Bard's Tale, that last one that they, they did for multiple reasons you know, the humor and the, the, the music and everything, but also um, just that, uh, it, it, you know, you pick up a sword, if it's better than the sword you get, it automatically sells the sword you have and you have, and it equips the so new sword you picked up basically. Right. That's mm -hmm. the system. Like it just does it for you, which I know like takes some of the fun out of it. Like when you start to get different kinds of, you can have a flaming sword versus an ice sword, or you want to like, you know, you want to start customizing and all that kind of stuff. But Man, I I think they should just have that as an option, like in pretty much every RPG. If you don't want to spend half your time freaking, okay, let me compare all of the 15 sets of armor that I just picked up, compare their different attributes, figure out which one's slightly better, equip that, sell it. Wait, let me check all of my party members, see if any of them can use the any of the ones that I picked. Okay. Now, you know, it's like, oh, Jesus. Fortunately... The enhanced editions of Baldur's Gate, and I don't remember if this was in the original or not. When you pick up an item, like you click on it so that it starts hovering, mm -hmm. it will tell you how it will affect you if you equip it. Yeah. So it will tell you like your Thacko will improve. Let's not get into <laughs> Thacko <laughs> and that nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, your Thacko will go from 15 to 13. And you're like, is that good? Anyway, <laughs> um, or it'll tell you that your armor class will increase or decrease in this case. Let's not get into it. Um, the eternal question, is higher or lower better? I can never mean. Well, here's a pop quiz is... Uh, AC two or AC negative four better? <laughs> Which of those is a better AC? <laughs> uh, I'll, right. make it a, I'll make it a poll in the chat for the chat and we'll see. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Go. Which of these is the best AC? And <laughs> zero negative four. Uh, which edition? Second edition? Second edition. Oh, second edition. I thought, I thought you were just going to like really mess people up and just not mention like the edition and then see like the chaos that ensues. Well, I mean, <laughs> some of them you can't have negatives. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that would limit it. Exactly. Was... <laughs> Is it better to have higher Thacko or lower Thacko? Spoiler lower Thacko. <laughs> so, oh, you just you have, voting. if you have a Thacko of 12 <laughs> and your opponent has an AC of negative four, what do you have to roll to hit them? Uh, say that again, Thacko of... Thacko of 12, a opponent has an AC of negative four. Uh, 16? Yes. I spent, a, I spent quite a bit of time in uh, 2E, both in like the computer RPGs and the tabletop versions. I'll be honest, I kind of miss Thacko like a little bit, but I, I really actually loved just like the bonkers levels of uh, like AC that you could achieve in third edition. So like the new Pathfinder game, I'm, I'm like really enjoying getting my armor uh, up to like 30, 32 right now. Yeah. The days of super high AC were interesting days. Um, that was kind of the case in fourth edition too. I think by the time we ended our um, Paragon Epic campaign, my AC was 44. And um, that was pretty good. I occasionally enemies would miss me, but you know, it wasn't frequent. Yeah, so I was the, the defender of the party. It was they were supposed to be attacking me. I remember like, so, you know, I don't know if this is a rookie DM mistake or whatever, but one of the first games I DM way, 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 way back in second edition when I was playing back then was, um, you know, I got the, the uh, you know, people ask, can I use this character? Can I use this character? Do I need to roll? And I said, no, you can use your character. And then some of them had all this super powerful stuff. So I was like, you know, I basically transported them naked to this place where they were going to start the campaign. And and, and but they each said like can i bring one item and i of course someone brought a bag of holding 
stuffed all of their like godlike armor and everything in there. And then like, you know, how do you balance the campaign when like one person's wearing like, you know, godlike armor and w w running around with a vorpal sword or whatever, and then everyone else is like, oh. Uh... Anyway. Yeah. Rookie mistake. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there's ways to ways to handle that. But, you know, I, I just remember like just going, you know, was you that just like your brother. You suck. You suck. Um, no, it was not my brother. It was a friend. But uh, yeah. Okay. It's like you, you, way to like you know not get in the spirit of it, man. Common early D and D experiences. Who else has been in a game that inadvertently went to Dark Sun and you're wearing a suit of full plate armor? Did that happen to anyone common. else? Yeah. No. You were being. And then you were immediately mobbed by everybody in the town for your armor. <laughs> Just whatever pieces of it they could tear off of you. Makes yeah. sense. It was nuts. I mean, that was that was kind of the thing with that with the early Planescape and and hopping between worlds, is that, um you'd kind of overwrite the themes of any particular setting with the themes of your game, which were always encountering exotic people and uh, strange worlds. It was kind of like Star Trek, but in Dungeons and Dragons, which yeah. is ironic because you had, you know, basically Dungeons <clears throat> and Dragons, but it's Star Trek and that was Traveler. So, I mean, the two game systems were coming together. It was a magical time. So, Brian mentioned that that was like multivariable algebra, and I, I thought that too. I was like, that's one thing about that. Go like, yeah. like Aaron, like you're running your your game with the kids and stuff. And if you still had to do that go and stuff, it would be like they're learning math when they're doing the yeah. D. I sold their parents on this is a math game. I don't know that they needed that much selling. They're like they're yeah. playing with other children <laughs> during the pandemic. It's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then they're all in D and D Beyond, so it's doing all their math for them. <laughs> But then, yeah. then one kiddo, the one who switched to Warlock, uh, has summon undead, I think, as a spell. And those summon ones, I wrote down. I wrote down what to do for David if he comes up again, because I keep forgetting like how to add all that weird. Because it's it doesn't do that addition for you because it's in the text of the spell. And then yeah. every time I'm like, damn it, what's his AC? Right. It's your right. spell level plus this number. Yeah, just write out the formula and then have, have everybody to copy paste into Roll Twenty or whatever. Like, I don't use Roll Twenty. I let Diddy D, D, D Beyond and Roll Twenty talk to each other, but I never yeah. remember what I'm supposed to type in Roll Twenty. So uh, Robert... the poll just ended, and chat generally got the the AC correct. Oh, that's good. <laughs> I opened that and then closed it immediately. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. Uh, Robert in the chat mentioned that he went through the process to play a first edition bard. Okay, so here's a little a little throwback. How did you qualify to play a bard in first edition? Hint, Does anybody know? It's really hard. There are a lot of prerequisites. Um, you should use your DM. Yeah, I was going to say, you <laughs> yeah. want to sleep with everything. Hey, uh, hey, hey, Aaron, we're talking about first edition. There was no sex in first edition D&D. &D. Oh, my apologies. <laughs> As fine. established, I did Where not did... play until 3.5. It's true. Where did babies and come from? immediately into fourth. So I don't know any of this stuff. So you all sound like grandpas. Let me, let me see if I remember this correctly. Did you start? I think you started. you started as a fighter. Or did you start as a rogue? It was one of those. You started, uh, yeah, or, rogue. A th no, it would have been a thief, not not a rogue, right? Mm -hmm. You would start as a thief, and then at some point you would start taking w magic user levels, which is the first equi first edition equivalent of wizard. And then at some point you would start taking druid levels, right? But once oh. you were taking druid levels, you were technically a bard at that point. I remember druid also being sort of like a prestige class that you had like various prereqs for. But maybe that was just for one of Perhaps the Perhaps you're right. Because uh, I do remember it being like, uh, you know, thief, because you need like a bunch of prerequisite skills. And then also it was some fighter, but you well, know, Robert, I, I don't remember specifically. Robert Emerson says it was fighter to fifth, then thief, then clerical studies as oh, a okay. druid. Fighter first. 
Yeah. I forgot that, you know, it was Meyer Doug said order. thief, then fighter, then magic user. So yeah, okay. I mean, both those guys are like old school gamers. So who knows? The point is, it was not a first level class and it was weird to get Ooh. into. So we're at 625 right now. So we got to play the recap and then we'll play the intro and back with our uh, episode. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Don't go away. In a minute. So wait, Rogar has a son? But Rogar's. And he's. Wait, where do you... baby dwarves come from? Ugh. They don't come out from under rocks. So the irregulars continued to flee from the witches, and things got even more complicated much faster. Now, Sturge did his damnedest to stymie some of the witches, particularly the one called Disgust, the one with the bow. He managed to use his rapier to snap her bowstring after sneaking up on her with his invisibility, or whatever the heck it is he does. And the bowstring even snapped her in the face, which was great. It broke her mask, actually. She wasn't happy about that. Still didn't see her face, though. The rest of the witches kept chasing them through the streets, of course, and ended up uh, cornering them a couple times. Stong ended up dragging Rogar with him because Rogar had been a bit incapacitated and ended up having to polymorph Rogar into a hamster and fling him over the mists that were choking the street. Yeah, that mist, bad news. Still, they eventually managed to get away from the witches, but things got even more complicated when they got down into the sewers. Now, down in the sewers, they were finally able to have a bit of a conversation with the people that had helped them escape, specifically the young woman and uh, the other horned woman that turned out to be an older Mirabelle, which is a big surprise. More of a surprise, she seemed convinced that uh, Stong should be dead, and apparently so should Cecilia. In fact, nobody believed that any of them were who they said they were. This, however, seems to be the alternate future that wooden-handed Sturge comes from, so I guess that question's answered finally. They led them through the sewers to the ruins of Briar House, where the rest of their whole gang were holed up. And it was there that Rogar met an interesting person, which turned out to be, apparently, his future son. Now, I want to know who the other parent is. Artemisia was in for her own surprise, given that, uh, well, apparently, in this alternate timeline, she had a daughter. With Lilton. Ugh. And I'm not sure if it's more surprising than the other thing, which is that apparently, this timeline's Artemisia turned into a dragon, killed a bunch of people, and flew away. So, you know, that's... Uh, weigh your options here. Now, Mirabelle scampered off. I don't think she really wanted to have come face to face right now with her dad, who is supposed to be dead. I need I remind you? And the rest of the Irregulars, uh, Cecilia, Sturge, Stong, all met with what they initially thought was the leader of this group, which uh, everyone had been calling the Mother, and were introduced to Lady Regante Bleth former leader of the Fire Knives. I guess former. Do the Fire Knives still exist in this timeline? She didn't buy their story, unsurprisingly. It is a bit of a stretch, but seemed to eventually come around on it at least, so that's the thing. But even she was like, no, I'm not the leader. M the mother is, or mother is, something like that. Something she also revealed when they told her what they were there for, uh, specifically to rescue Sarshin, everyone's favorite himbo, is that Sarshin in this timeline is the Knight of the Witch Queen, which is what they all call the Golden Raven. But I think the biggest surprise of the evening came when Cecilia and Artemisia, hearing a strange chime that only they and Artemisia's daughter seemed to be able to hear, uh, rushed out to the garden and found a cloaked woman who then turned and revealed herself to be an elven woman with silver hair who greeted them as her daughters. Well, scratch that theory about the Golden Raven, I guess. And my cats keep making...